spondylolisthesis. As you can see here in this picture, the vertebrae is slipped out of its place and it is moving forward leaving the posterior structures behind and this forward slippage is therefore known as spondylolisthesis. If the slippage occur in a reverse direction, then one would call it a retrolysthesis. For spondylolisthesis itself, today in this part 1 video, I'll cover the basics and the subtypes of spondylolisthesis, which is the pediatric or adolescent type. And these two will be covered in the next video. For the basics itself, we could see that from the epidemiology, slippage could occur as early as 4 to 6 years, especially those in the pediatric type. Spondylolisthesis itself comes from the suffix of olisthesis, which is the forward slippage of one vertebrae on another. And basically, this condition could be classified using these two types, which is the Mayerding classification uh, that grades the listesis based on the percentage of the slippage starting from 25, under 25 to over 100% in grade 5 listesis or otherwise also known as spondyloptosis. And these are the pictures depicting how much the slippage has occurred. And the slippage is usually determined from the posterior aspect of the vertebral body. And it's being compared to the vertebral body that is beneath it. As you can see here in the grade 5, in the gray, air, gray colored vertebrae, the whole vertebrae has slipped out of its place. And therefore, the percentage of the slippage is over 100%. Other classification system would include the one mentioned by the Newman, Wills, and McNabb, which further classify these conditions into its basic types, such as the ones depicted here. We could see here that there are basic types floating from the type 1, which is caused by a dysplastic spine, type 2 ABC caused by ismic spondylolisthesis, type 3, 4, and 5 caused by degenerative traumatic or neoplastic type. This is another table that you could see depicting how the different or the various types of spondylolisthesis. You could say that this classification scheme is based on the etiological factor. And next, moving on, since the spine is slipping forward, there should be some measurements that help us determine how much the spine has slipped, how much the spine has changed in terms of balance, and what are the degrees of the slip angle. Now, the forward slippage percentage, as mentioned by Taylor, it is measured by determining the posterior aspect of the S1 and also the degree of the percentage measured from this reference line to the posterior aspect of the vertebral body, otherwise noted as A. Well, A divided by B gives us the percentage of the forward slippage. And the scheme here from the picture B from grade 1 to grade 5 are those mentioned by Mayerding earlier. And the last picture here, C, is the slip angle, which is measured from the superior aspect of the vertebral body that has slipped compared to the perpendicular line that is drawn from the posterior edge of the sacrum. And these are the sacrum, are the, sorry, the slip angle. Now, after knowing how to measure these values, you could classify them and determine whether or not there is any imbalance in the spine. We could see here that the slip angle is normally less than zero degree. As for other reference line that should be evaluated in a patient with spondylolisthesis, that would include the pelvic incidence, the pelvic tilt, and also the sacral slope. Now I'm going to show you here 
a summary regarding these lines. So the pelvic incidence as the one here in red is a line perpendicular to the midpoint of the sacral end plate and then the second line connects the same reference point to the center of the femoral head and the angle formed by these two lines are called the pelvic incidence. As for the pelvic tilt itself, it is a line from the midpoint of the sacrum and is drawn to the center of the femoral heads. And then the angle formed between this line and a vertical reference line is called the pelvic tilt. As for the sacral slope, it is a line parallel to the sacral end plate. And then the angle formed between this line and a horizontal line is called the sacral slope. Well, you would think that why should I measure all of these? They seem complicated. Do they have any meanings in evaluating a patient? Yes, they do. Because these measurements determine what is known as the sagittal balance. The sagittal balance basically shows us how much our body has tilted tilting whether it is to the anterior or to the posterior aspect. Now normally, our sagittal balance can be determined by drawing a line starting from the C7. C7 sagittal vertical axis or the plumb line. Normally, if you draw a line from the C7, when it goes down all the way to the pelvic, it should drop at the area of minus 3, meaning posterior to the posterior superior S1 vertebral body, or positive 3, or anterior to the posterior superior S1 vertebral body. Any measurement that goes even posterior to this point is referred as negative balance and any measurements that exceeds 3 from the posterior superior aspect of the S1 vertebral body is determined as positive balance. Now, the components of the sagittal balance is usually evaluated from C7 down to the S1 using the C7 SVA that I've mentioned before. And these components include the evaluation of the thoracic kyphosis, the thoracolumbar kyphosis, the lumbar lordosis, and also the pelvic incidence. But some authors would even evaluate in a more global fashion, taking the measurements even higher up from the basian down to the femoral heads. But we are going to discuss furthermore regarding this, this, more, this simple type of measurements. For the thoracic kyphosis, normally the spine should be around 30 degree and it is measured from the top of the T2 to the bottom of the T12. And for the thoracolumbar kyphosis, should be normally at 0 degree. Measuring Measurements are taken from the upper aspect of T10 down to the lower aspect of L2. And for the lumbar lordosis, it is me measured from the lower aspect of T12 up to the upper aspect of S1 and should be normally around 31 to 79 degree. Now, if you take into measurements all of these values, then you could obtain a formula that is being used to determine whether the patient is still in a good balance or not. The pelvic incidence and lumbar lordosis along with thoracic kyphosis is being added all together and all the kyphotic curve is considered as positive values and all the lordotic curve are considered in negative values and if you add up all of these, you should obtain around 22 degree to guide to know this formula helps you guide surgical correction because the optimal value you want to achieve post-surgery should be at the range of 20 to 45 degree. Now, when you have obtained all those data, 
and you have obtained you have known this formula you should be able to determine the value of the correction that you are going to do during surgery because the final achievement is considered well if the patient's sagittal balance is well now moving on these pelvic measurements which earlier included the pelvic incidence pelvic tilt and sacral slope each has a very different meaning for the pelvic incidence it measures the orientation of the sacrum relative to the pelvic it is a fixed number and it is always independent of body position normally it ranges 52 more or less 9 degrees and the pelvic tilt is a measurement which it measure the spatial orientation of the sacrum relative to the femoral head normally this should also be around 11 degree now moving on once you have known all these measurements and you have learned about all the basics regarding the spondylolisthesis case we could move on to discussing each and every type of spondylolisthesis Oh, I'm sorry, there's a little bit explanation regarding instability that you could see here because instability is a word that is now very commonly used in practice. Patients usually come and you diagnose them with instability. You need evidence, you need proof to show the patient that they indeed have instability that needs treatment and to be able to point that out you need to find these findings on the plain x-ray usually during the change of body position whether it is in a flex or in extended position the disc angle remains rather constant but if in this dynamic x-rays or x-rays that are taken in dynamically in a flex position or in extended position when there are this angle change exceeding 10 degrees or translation of the vertebral body exceeding 3 millimeters, then the spine is considered unstable. These values vary according to various authors. Now for the MRI itself, you usually cannot perform a dynamic view because moving around in while the MRI image is being taken may distort the images and the MRI findings that could be sought out is the presence of facet fluid or interspinous fluid. Okay, now also in this video, I'm going to cover a little bit regarding the pediatric or adolescent type of spondylolisthesis. As you could see here, etiologically, usually the condition may be caused by Repetitive hyperextension of the spine, which causes shear stress over at the pars interarticularis. But some other conditions may also lead to the development of this spondylolisthesis, which is the spina bifida occult type, the thoracic hyperkyphosis, or the Schumann's disease, which I will cover in other videos sometime in the future. And the diagnosis, once again, since this occur in a pediatric patient, history taking may be a little bit challenging. You need to obtain any information from their parents regarding any pain or any radicular findings, especially involving the L5 nerve root. You need to know that if a nerve root is being involved, we call it a radiculopathy and each and every one of the nerve root has specific function specific sensory and motoric functions you need to review your anatomy to find out what each of these nerve roots do for the physical findings patients with spondylolisthesis pediatric population usually may present with a waddle gait caused once again by the l5 radiculopathy and the patient may also have a heart-shaped buttock with a palpable step off of the 
posterior region along with tightness of the hamstring muscles. Now, for the treatment of these conditions, usually we focus more on non-operative because these patients once again are in a very young age and therefore the first step would be non-operative. Activity modification can be advised and for the grade 1 slip or slippage under 25%, the patient may usually return to normal activities such as contact spots once the patient is asymptomatic. While in a higher grade slip such as the grade 2 slip, activities should be restricted. Now this is indicated in all grades of condition as an initial treatment but there are certain risks for progression of this condition which include younger age, female patient, sleep angle more than 10 degrees and in cases with higher grade sleep. Now operatively patients could also be treated but the indication must include the evidence of a sleep progression which is objectively proven by measurements of the slip angle, the forward slippage percentage by Taylor during consecutive visits to the doctors, and the patient may, pers may have persistent severe back or leg pain along with weakness of the muscles. Now, the methods may include reduction or no reduction because you need to know that when a spine has gone out of its normal place or sublux in this case, moving forward, then when you do a spontaneous reduction of the spine, some nerve roots are ought to be pulled and when they are pulled or in other terms traction force are being applied to it, there should be a nerve root injury. And this is proven by various authors that around 20 to 30 percent incidence of L5 root injuries are found in patients with spine spondylolisthesis that are being reduced acutely. So usually, in a slip that is still slightly low grade, you only need to do a L5-S1 posterior lateral fusion in situ. While in higher grades, you could fuse a little bit higher up, going to the L4 to S1 bilateral posterior lateral fusion in situ. Now, the L5 is usually not being chosen as the position of as the placement site of the pedicle screws because the L5 is already too far anterior to maintain the effect of the L5 S1 fusion. Now to better understand the various types of spine surgery, I will cover them in another video regarding spine surgery basics. Now that will be all for today's teaching. I hope you enjoy this video and do look forward for the next video the spondylolisthesis part 2 which covers the adult ismic type of spondylolisthesis and the degenerative type of spondylolisthesis. Thanks again for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the orthopedic tutors for more videos.